let's do a thought experiment here. Let's say that we discover sometime in the next few years that there's a comet or an asteroid out there that's orbiting the sun and the astronomers calculate its orbit and they discover that somewhere down the road a generation or two hence or maybe a decade or two it's going to collide with earth. What do we what's our response to that? What do we do? Now this is, to me, extremely interesting because it leads to this whole cosmic architecture that I think is going to be necessary for us to really comprehend in order to see how these cycles are unfolding, where we are in the cycles, what happens at the, at the critical junctures or the nodal points within those cycles. This is um, a book that I've referenced a number of times in here called Hamlet's Mill. And you know what Ham, the premise of Hamlet's Mill? Hamlet's Mill was this book published in 1969, I believe. It was the life's work of two scholars, um, Hersha von Deschend and Georges George de Santayana, I think is what, wasn't that the two authors, right? They concluded in this big 500-page tome, 600-page tome, the whole premise of the book was essentially that the ancient world, the archaic world, had known about processional, processional motion, the procession of the equinoxes, long before supposedly it was discovered by Hipparchus. Was it Hipparchus or Aristarchus? Hipparchus, yeah. Before it was discovered by Hipparchus, what, 500 B.C.? 300 B.C.? 100 B.C., okay. Give or take a few centuries. The whole point was is that it had been understood in the archaic world perhaps even thousands of years before Hipparchus who is now credited with with discovering it okay um, anyways they they it's a book it's it's a hard book to get around but it's definitely worth reading I mean they what they do as far as bringing forward the idea that that there's a scientific basis to the archaic mythology is probably, you know, they, they should be credited up along with people like Joseph Campbell and so forth who, who helped to, to bring the idea of mythology and, and place it on a, a firm scholarly basis and evolved beyond this idea that it was just a bunch of superstitious um, gibberish that, that ignorant pre-literate, pre pre-scientific people came up with. Uh, anyways, this is what, what they're, they're talking about, the, the, the Tammuz, and Tammuz um, was a counterpart to all the ancient, all the myths all over the world from, you know, Osiris to Quetzalcoatl, I mean, you name them, Mithras, Jesus in the Christian tradition, the idea of a dying and resurrected God. And Tammuz was one of these dying and resurrected gods. They're referring to here, uh, who was Tammuz? The grain god dying with the season. Now it is clear he was astronomical, first of all. So much has been written about his fertility rites that it took time to locate the real date. The lament over Adonis Tammuz, who were the same god, did not fall simply in late summer. It took place in the night between July 19th and 20th. Hmm. Well, it's a date we've just been talking about here. The exact date which marked the opening of the Egyptian year. Now we're talking here about a, a commemoration that was 2,000 years later. Basically, in the Egyptian mysteries, the dying and resurrection of Tammuz was part of these, the Egyptian, I mean the Greek esoterica, the Eleusinian mysteries and so on, that uh, lasted 
probably from the time of the pre-Socratics, 5 to 800 BC, down to probably even the fall of the Roman Empire around 300 AD. A lot of the mysteries of the Eleusinians got preserved in the Mithraic rites. The Eleusinian rites were Greek, the Mithraic rites were Roman. And there was a, uh, a, a Roman tradition that basically adapted these to the times. And because of the fact that all of these myths are ultimately rooted in astronomical events, and the, the astronomical order is constantly changing, the myths have to be updated. Anyways, let's go on here. Um, for 3,000 years, that date marked the heliacal rising of Sirius. The amazing significance of Sirius as leader of the planets, or as referred to the eighth planet, so to speak, and of Pan, the dance master, as well as the real cosmocrator, cosmocrator, interesting word. Cosmocrator was the cosmic being that basically worked the levers that kept the machinery of the whole solar system working. That was the cosmocrator. Uh, the important point is that the extraordinary role of Sirius is not the product of the fancy of silly pontiffs, but an astronomical fact. During the whole 3,000 year history of Egypt, Sirius rose every fourth year on July 20th of the Julian calendar. In other words, and this is where it's complicated, and hopefully I will be able to demonstrate this with my astronomy software, but here's the key point. Sirius was not influenced by the processional motion, which must have led to the conviction that Sirius was more than just one fixed star among others. And so when Sirius fell, Great Pan was dead. And there's a reference to another myth of a dying and resurrected God. Now did you get what, what, what they were saying there? Sirius was not influenced by the processional motion. If I turn to this other book that I brought here, this is Astronomy of the Ancients, and there's an article in here by an astronomer named Kenneth Brecher about Sirius. And I read some of this a couple of weeks ago, talking about the redness of Sirius. You recall that, that in all of the ancient accounts of Sirius, it was referred to as a red star. What is the significance of, now we could go out right now and look up there in the south, southern sky and you'll see Sirius and it's not at all a red star, it's a blue-white star. Yes, but what, what, let's think about, let's review the facts we know about Sirius. What are some things we know about Sirius? I'll start it out. It's called the dog star, right? Why the dog star? What's the connection with dogs? Well, what else do we know about Sirius? This is a memory test. Paul, tell us. What else do we know? What was it? A and B. Good. A and B. It's a binary star system, isn't it? That's the main thing I was looking for. It's a binary star system. Sirius A and Sirius B. When we look out and we see a blue-white star that's sitting up in the southern sky right now, that's Sirius A. We don't see Sirius B. Why not? It's a dwarf star. It's a star in the late stages of its lifespan. Which means what? It means that it's gone through the, the normal stellar cycle. It's already gone nova, right? In order for it now to be a white dwarf implies that at some point it's passed through the red giant phase. Yeah, see, so now isn't this, the problem is he points out in here is any time scale that we, that we think of stellar evolution is not going to allow somebody 2,000 to 3,000 years ago to have seen, to actually witnessed Sirius B becoming a red giant. Unless, and, and this is what he doesn't mention. So he tries to go, what he tries to do is get around it and say, well, there's a lot of other reasons. There must have been dust in the atmosphere. I think that's what he concludes. 
which is an you know, interesting idea. But, you know, there was just an interesting report that came out a couple of weeks ago, the finding of human footprints. Did you hear about that? Finding of human footprints in uh, where? Kenya. Kenya, thank you. Do you remember how old they were? 1.5 million. And for all, for all intents and purposes, they looked like exactly modern footprints. And it's hard to conceive of a modern foot being on the bottom of a creature, you know, a whole lot different than, than we are, you know. Um, now, you know, we, we're not going to jump to any conclusions from that because I've been using the data 150,000 to 200,000 years for the span of time because that's the span of time in which we can say with a fair amount of confidence and conviction that modern humans have been around. But what this guy is doing is he's saying, well, there's no way that it could have been red giant 2,000 or 3,000 years ago and be witnessed by people. However, 2,000 or 3,000 years ago, people may have been the inheritors of a much, much older tradition about Sirius that was handed down in which people did actually witness Sirius going Nova, going, going red giant. Now, of course, Sirius being just a little bit over eight light years away, that's in our immediate stellar neighborhood. Sirius B going super, going red giant, probably would have had some relatively profound consequences for our own solar system as well as life on Earth. It could very well be that somewhere buried way back in the mythology is the memory of an event where human beings witnessed a, a cosmic event, Sirius B going red giant, and then experiencing consequences here on Earth and making that direct association. We don't know when Sirius B would have gone Nova, this is or gone Red Giant. This is all purely speculative. Anyways, that's what he was talking about. He talks about in here a couple of Sirius. The, the name of the the article he wrote in here is called Sirius Enigmas, and uh, he says a, after going through another possibilities, he says that a third possibility is that Sirius B was a Red Giant a million years ago, say in pre Neanderthal times. I think many astrophysicists would reluctantly allow that. If so, one could claim, with every anthropologist in the world convulsed by laughter, that the Neanderthals observed the sky, recorded the fact that Sirius was red, and passed down that fact in a tradition that lasted a million years. That doesn't seem very likely. However, I think that the astrophysics would allow Sirius to be red giant much sooner than a million years ago. Also, he's also falling into an anthropological misconception that Neanderthals were predecessors of modern humans, which they weren't. They were, they were a parallel species. In fact, there's some evidence that modern humans actually preceded Neanderthals in the fossil record. We know that, ne that humans and Neanderthals followed parallel paths for at least 100,000 years. And then somewhere around between 26,000 and 30,000 years ago, the Neanderthals disappeared. At one point, you know, in the last half a million years or so, there have been 13 other hominid species on Earth besides, and we, in fact, I think we need to add one, the hobbits that they discovered a couple of years ago, adds to the number of hominid species that we have probably shared the planet with at one time or another. But of all of these hominid species, the only one that still exists is modern Homo sapiens sapiens, us. So all of the others have somewhere succumbed to whatever these evolutionary forces are that renders species extinct. So let's go back to something else he says about Sirius here. Um, he says that Sirius has played a prominent role in stellar astronomy and physics over the past 200 years. In 1710, for example, Edmund Halley compared the various star positions he had measured with those measured 1,500 years earlier by Ptolemy and decided that Sirius, Arcturus, and Aldebaran were in the wrong places in the sky. They were wrong by about a degree, twice the diameter of the sun. Halley could hardly think that Ptolemy could have made so big an error 
Therefore, he concluded the stars must move amongst each other. A much more subtle finding came in 1836 when Friedrich Bessel made a careful study of the motion of Sirius. Bessel determined that Sirius was moving against the background of stars at the rate of about one arc second per year. But it was also wriggling, wriggling sinusoidally as well with a maximum amplitude of 11 arc seconds and a period of about 50 years. What was driving the sinusoidal motion with a period of about 50 years? Sirius B, exactly. Sirius A and Sirius B are going around a common barycenter every 50 years. So there's this 50 year cycle, periodicity going on out there and every 50 years Sirius B will sort of form an alignment so there's Sirius A, Sirius B in our own solar system. Or we could say our Sun, Sirius B, Sirius A forming an alignment every 50 years. The other thing he noticed, Sirius moving against the backdrop of stars one arc second per year. What could that possibly mean? Let's think about that, one arc second per year. We said that precession of the equinoxes is 50 seconds of arc per year. So you'll notice that Sirius will move against the backdrop of stars the same amount of the precession and it'll do it in 50 years. But what else? Let's see. One arc second per... So in other words, we look out there at Sirius, which is a nearby neighbor star, and we look at it against the, the, the backdrop of the far distant stars that might be 50 or 100 or several hundred light years away. Remember, Sirius is just, uh, just over eight light years away, okay? So that's very close in the astronomical sense. So is Arcturus and Aldebaran. And in fact, there's a group of stars that all seem to be, say, within roughly 20 to 50 light years of Earth. And we're going to talk about that, probably not tonight, but there seems to be a local stellar neighborhood of stars. And what we're getting at here is there may be a coherent system to these stars. But if you think about this, let's picture. Now, we look at Sirius, watch it from year to year, and see that it's very slowly moving against the backdrop of stars. Okay? If we go out and we were able to, like, use a software program like this, and look at the sun, from year to year, or from day to day, what would it appear to be doing? Moving toward us. Not toward us, but I mean, right now we go out. Let's let's pull up the astron. Let's pull up the program here and look at it and see. Um, Voyager point point five. We'll open this up. Now, what's happening with the sun against the stars? Don't pay attention to the planets. Just look at the sun against the stars. The sun is moving, isn't it? Yes, it is. Okay, now I'm going to stop it. And... Oh, stop there, sorry. Okay, go back to now. Uh, go ahead one hour to tomorrow morning. Okay, now I'm going to set it on one day. Here's one day. And we can see the sun. Now let's watch it. It's moving against the sun, right? I mean, again, against the, the stars. You see it moving against the stars? Now, is that the sun out there moving against the star? No, that's not the sun moving, is it? What is it that's moving? It's the earth moving around the sun, right, that gives this illusion that we're seeing right here. The sun is moving through the constellations. See there, look, coming above the uh, celestial equator, going below the celestial equator. Then it'll loop around. It'll come back up in the celestial equator. But this is not the sun moving like that. It's the earth going around the sun. So obviously, if, we're, if we were able to look at the sun here and see the constellation of Taurus, six months later, what would we see the sun against? What's across from Taurus? Scorpio. Scorpio. So let's do this. I'm going to 
Do you see the sun there against the constellation of Taurus right here, right? Okay, there's the Pleiades up there. Now I'm going to set this for uh, six months. And let's jump six months. And what do we see here? There's the sun. I don't know if you can make this out, but here's Scorpio right here. Just, just as Verlaine predicted. So what we see is that when, when we are on the side of Taurus, the sun looks like it's in Scorpio. When our Earth has gone around six months later, we're now on the side of Scorpio, so we look back at the sun, and it would appear against the backdrop of Taurus. The point here is that it's the sun is, for all effects and purposes, stationary, and it's the Earth that moving around the sun that gives this illusion that it's the sun moving against the stars. The rate of that movement? Well, given that there's 360 degrees in a circle, 365 days in a year, you can see that it almost works out to be one degree of motion per day. So what you can actually discern from that is by looking at the motion of the sun, let's just round it off and say it's a degree per day, it's not the sun moving a degree per day, it's the earth moving in its orbit one degree per day. Now, take the same principle, the same concept, and apply it to what we just said about Sirius. Sirius appears to be moving against the backdrop of stars one arc second per year. Could it be that it's not really Sirius that's moving, but instead that it's us that's moving relative to Sirius? Yes, it could be. It could be. What? That's true. Yes, it is true. In fact, I would argue that that's probably what we're going to eventually discover. So is that disputed now by astronomers? Well, it's not even looked at by astronomers. It's not even considered, really, other than to notice that to take this idea that I'm presenting here, we're going back to the archaic traditions. And that's what um, they were talking about in Hamlet's Mill. I'll reread what they said. Now think about this. During the whole 3,000-year history of Egypt, Sirius rose every fourth year on July 20th of the Julian calendar. In other words, Sirius was not influenced by the procession, which have, must have led to the conviction that Sirius was more than just one fixed star among others. Now, let's, let's see, ah, here's my calculator. Yes. When did, when did those guys write? Was it in the uh, these 60s, 1960s. And then this, this thing here that I was reading from was written in the 70s. Yes, this was the 70s, this was the 60s. But, you know, Asimov uh, proposed the idea of a local neighborhood in the Foundation Trilogy. Oh, did he? 50 light years, and the outer one was the planet Aurora. See, now I didn't even know that. And didn't I just say 30 to 50 light years? So I guess me and a Isaac are on the same. And you know when he had the idea to write the Foundation Trilogy? He was getting on a bus somewhere around the uh, end of World War II. And so the idea of the local neighborhood moving on its own in the, oh, near, near the galaxy is, uh, is not necessarily new with uh, what's his name, Hamilton and Millwood. Uh huh. What are those guys? <laughs> Dashand, Von Deschand and Santayana, the authors of Hamlet's Mill. Yeah. Okay, let's let's. Well, the question is, where did Asimov get Oh. Things built around that. They're uh, looking for the earth and everything, and it's this local neighborhood that they zoom in on. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the real thing to look for is what's the barycenter for that local grouping of stars, and. Uh, I, th I think the astronomers may be a good question. Um, different criteria and they group them different ways, but there's probably some data available on there. Well, I have, of course, at this point, Bill, I don't think that there's any school of astro astronomical thought that is looking for a more local galactic orbital center. I think most of them think we go from, you know, 
planets orbiting the sun, sun orbiting the galaxy. But as Rodney Collin in the theory of celestial influence pointed out half a century ago, when you begin to look at the intervals of, co of the, the cosmic timing, you can look at satellites to planets, planets to stars, and stars to, to galaxies. And he pointed out that, well, between stars and galaxies, there's a gap that if you uh, hypothesize that within that there are subgalactic orbital centers, you now have this harmonic series without gaps. But you have the star clusters, of course. You know. Oh yeah, you have star clusters. Yeah. But they had, uh, yeah, the stuff that's a little, bit, a little larger scale than mm. Well here, right here, I have the quote from Rodney Collin from 1954. He says, we have posited that the next cosmic world above the solar system to be the Milky Way. But there are indications that the gap in size here is impassably great. Later, when we come to measure the relative sizes and dimensions of the cosmos which we have been able to identify, we will see that the factor of multiplication between the solar system and the Milky Way is far greater than that between cell and man, between man and nature, terrestrial nature, between nature and earth, between earth and solar system. The solar system seems lost in the distances of the Milky Way as a single man would be lost on the surface of the earth. Were it not for the orderly world of nature of which he forms a part and which mediates, so to speak, between him and it. The diameter of the Earth, for instance, is one millionth that of the solar system. But the diameter of the solar system is only about one forty millionth of the Milky Way. When in our own system we find such relationships, it is not between sun and planets, but between sun and satellites of planets. That is to say, by analogy of scale and mass, we should expect the solar system to be revolving about some greater entity, which in its turn was revolving about the center of the Milky Way. Just as the moon revolves about the earth, which in turn revolves about the sun. And then he asked the question, what and where is this sun of our sun? And of course then that brings us to the concept of the ancient occult concept of the sun behind the sun. Have you ever heard of that? No. The sun behind the sun? No. No? Ah, well, you've heard of it now. The sun behind the sun. Well, let's see if we can find some clues here. How many of you ever read Albert Pike? Morals and Dogma? Uh, the summer, this is what he had to say on page 467 of the Morals and Dogma. The summer solstice was not less an important point in the sun's march than the vernal equinox, especially to the Egyptians, to whom it not only marked the end and term of the increasing length of the days and the domination of light and the maximum of the sun's elevation, but also the annual recurrence of that phenomena peculiar to Egypt, the rising of the Nile, which, ever accompanying the sun in his course, seemed to rise and fall as the days grew longer and shorter, being lowest at the winter solstice and highest at that of summer. Thus the sun seemed to regulate the swelling of the Nile, and the time of his arrival at the solstitial point being that of the first rising of the Nile, was selected by the Egyptians as the beginning of a year which they called the year of God and of the Sothic period, or the period of Sothis. And Sothis was the Greek name for which star? Sirius. The dog star, who, rising in the morning, fixed that epoch so important to the people of Egypt. And it was basically the rising phenomena that we just saw here that is now occurring on July 4th. 
This year was also called the heliacal year, that is the solar year, and the canicular year. Canicular, coming from the word presumably Canis, right? Canis, as in Canis Major, the dog. And it consisted of 365 days without intercalation. So that at the end of four years, or of four times 365 days, making 1,460 days, it needed to add a day to make four complete revolutions of the sun. Observing that the annual return of the rising of the Nile was always accompanied by the appearance of this beautiful star, which at that period showed itself in the direction of the sources of that river, because the southeast, and it seemed to warn the husbandman to be careful not to be surprised by the inundation. The Ethiopian compared this act of that star to that of the animal which, by barking, gives warning of danger. Now that's interesting because here's another important clue in, 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 in uh, penetrating into this mystery of Sirius, the dog star. Dogs gave warning of danger. Sirius, in its turn, did it give warning of danger somehow? Did it somehow clue the Egyptian? Well, clearly we know from what we've learned now that the rising of Sirius with the sun heralded the inundation of the Nile. But when we remember that the, inundate, that the Nile River to the Egyptians was the terrestrial counterpart of the Milky Way, and when we remember that the flooding of the Nile was considered to be a terrestrial counterpart to the great cosmic flood that had destroyed the world at the end of the last world age, we have the idea that Sirius is giving forewarning of the flood. This, the flood of, in this case, the flood which not only brought down the waters but also provided for renewal of Egyptian civilization. Because the whole basis of Egyptian civilization was agricultural and the floodplain of the Nile was the repository of this fertile silt carried down by the flood waters of the Nile spread afresh over the floodplain with each year which then allowed Egyptian civilization to thrive. So we have the idea of the dog giving warning, giving a warning associated with Sirius, the dog star, right? With the possible same idea that it was perhaps somehow connected in the archaic mind with some kind of a warning or cosmic warning. Now, he goes on to tie this somewhat in with the mysteries of Freemasonry. And this is what he says. The ornaments of a lodge, in the Masonic ritual, they talk about the ornaments in the lodge. And these are things that when you go in, you're, they're actually things that you see in the lodge. The ornaments of the lodge are said to be the mosaic pavement, the indented tessel, and the blazing star. The mosaic pavement checkered in squares or lozenges is said to represent the ground floor of King Solomon's temple. And the indented tessel, which was a decorative border around the ceiling of the lodge, that beautiful tessellated border which surrounded it was again derived from Solomon's temple. The blazing star in the center is said to be an emblem of divine providence and commemorative of the star which appeared to guide the wise men of the East to the place of the Nativity. But to find in the blazing star of five points an illusion of divine providence is a later fanciful addition. To make it commemorative of the star that is said to have guided the Magi is to give it a meaning comparatively modern. Originally, it represented Sirius or the dog star. So. In the Masonic Mysteries, part of the whole ritual pattern revolves around the blazing star. And you will often see, in, and I will show you, lots of, Masonic, um, lots of Masonic imagery that has the blazing star. Well, the eastern star is the blazing star rotated 36 degrees. Um, Okay, now, 
How how much did we say that Sirius moved against the backdrop of fixed star? Not one degree. One arc second per year. Okay, now we know we can we can again in round numbers. If we see the sun apparently moving one degree per day, then how many degrees is I mean how many days are implied in a full orbit of the Earth? 300, yeah, or yeah, or in round numbers, 360. Okay, if in fact we're hypothesizing that Sirius sits at or near an orbital center, and that one arc second of motion per year is an actually an indication of our own solar system's motion relative to Sirius, then how long of a period or how long of a cycle are we talking about? Did you hear what Jeremy said? Okay. Well, before you blurt out the answer, how how do you come with that? Up with that answer? There are two ways. It's fifty seconds of arc for our precession. Well, forget that. Just go the one arc second per year to keep it simple. Uh, Three hundred sixty times sixty times sixty. There's sixty sixty arc seconds in an arc minute. 60 arc minutes in a degree and 360 degrees in a whole orbital circle. So, if you go 60 seconds of arc times the 60 minutes, that's 60 times 60, which is 300. Would you like to confirm this for us, Paul? You can't. Who, who's good with a calculator? Okay. Go 60 times 60, which is 360. I mean 3,600, and then go that times 360 for the number of degrees. So what we're doing is we're taking the full circle, how many arc seconds in a full circle? There's 360 degrees, each degree has 60 minutes, each minute has 60 arc seconds. 1,296,000. Now if it's one arc second per year, what period are we talking about for a, we'll call it a, 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 a Syrian year then? 1,296,000 years. That's how long it would take, wouldn't it? Okay, now, when we turn, all right, here is the tabulation of the ancient Vedic ages. And what we see here is that we have in duration in divine years and we have this whole canon of sacred numbers that we've talked about in here and need to talk about more duration in human years total in divine years total in human years we see we've got the Kali Yuga the Dwapara Yuga, the Treta Yuga, and the Satya Yuga if we look at the Treta Yuga the span of time for the cycle of the Treta Yuga is how long? 1,296,000 years there it is, right there. Handed down from some of the oldest religious astronomical writings in history, right here, the Vedic ages. 1,296,000 years. So we're hypothesizing here that that actually represents a real astronomical cycle that may be related to the motion of our own solar system relative to Sirius, either as the orbital center or as an object which is very close to that orbital center. Just as, you know, Mercury is much closer to the orbital center of our solar system than is Venus, and which is in turn closer to the orbital center than is Earth. That, in turn, is also interesting, <clears throat> because when we look at that period of 1,296,000 years, there seems to be a, fifth, a harmonic based upon the number 50 going on here. Is that, do you st who's got the calculator, you still got the calculator, Paul? Okay, here's what I want you to do. We've got a, we've got a cycle now, a hypo hypothetical cycle of 1,296,000 years. Divide that by the number of years in the, great, in the processional cycle, 25,920. So if this number should be in your calculator, divide this by 25,920, which should be a, very familiar number by now to you. And what'd you get? 50. Precisely 50, right? 
So as it turns out, the precessional motion of our Earth somehow seems to be related to this Treta Yuga, which could very possibly be a much greater cycle. So we find that there is a periodicity between Sirius A and Sirius B of 50 years. And we find there's a periodicity between this Treta Yuga and the precessional cycle of 50 great years. How much Don't, well, you know. See, here's the thing. If we assume that we humans, modern humans, with our intelligence have been around for a couple of hundred thousand years, you know, think about the time span in which we have created this modern scientific civilization. Within the span of a couple of hundred thousand years, this is just an eye blink. Who knows what humans may have achieved? Right, who knows? And I'm perfectly willing to accept the fact that, you know, we may be only one in a long succession of highly advanced civilizations that have inhabited this planet. This is kind of bringing us up to another mystery that I've been kind of like vectoring towards here for quite a while without actually skirting around it without ever actually addressing it. But it's this. Let's, let's do a thought experiment here. Let's say that we discover sometime in the next few years that there's a comet or an asteroid out there that's orbiting the sun and the astronomers calculate its orbit and they discover that somewhere down the road a generation or two hence or maybe a decade or two it's going to collide with earth what do we what's our response to that what do we do move <laughs> move okay go somewhere else <laughs> go somewhere else that's an interesting idea but where do we go? I mean, do we go from America to South America or from... Getting a spaceship. L5. Okay. Cosmic Belize. See, now I think we're getting to what I consider to be probably one of the great secrets of the occult mysteries and the occult traditions. And when we look at things like at the dawn of the modern round of civilization, where it appears that these people had tremendously sophisticated knowledge of astronomy and geodesy and uh, of, of engineering, you know. Um, where did that come from? You know, when, when we see at the very dawn of civ recorded civilization, the Indus Valley, uh, the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, the Nile Valley, when we see here and even in North America, we go back 4,000 to 5,000 years ago. We go back to the old kingdom of Egypt, and you go to prior to the old kingdom, and what you see is, or the assumption is in the, in the conventional terms, is basically you had a culture of farmers. Now, all of a sudden, within one generation, you're building pyramids four, over 400 feet high that would tax the engineering ability, no, probably even exceed the engineering abilities of modern humans if we were even so motivated to build such a thing. Well, to me, there's a huge disconnect between the conventional models of history and the actual evidence that we see manifesting at the dawn of recorded history. We see the presence of advanced knowledge at the dawn of recorded history, advanced scientific knowledge. Where did that come from? Well, as you should be well aware now, as I have been beating this horse to death for several years now, and in the time since we started doing these lectures, what, close to three years ago, a lot of new data has come in. You know, when I started these lectures, I was assuming that the Holocene itself, the last 10,000 years, was a relatively stable, without any major intervening catastrophes. I've totally changed my point of view since then. Now I recognize that there have been multiple catastrophes within the Holocene. Now none of the magnitude of the great catastrophe of 12,900 years ago. That still ranks preeminent of global catastrophes for at least the last five million years. 
whatever happened 12,900 years ago, and we've been talking about it ad nauseum in here, we still don't really know what happened. We're speculating educated guesses and making uh, educated speculation, but we really don't know. I still think most likely what happened, it had to be some kind of a cosmic encounter event. The, the discovery of the nanodiamonds, the discovery of the microspherals and the cosmic evidence that has been strewn all over the planet to 12,900 years ago. Actually, well, we know it was a one-two punch that, that finally took us out of it. But we see that, interestingly, I, I was listening to a lecture that I gave at Warren Wilson College in 1994. And in that lecture, I named the date of 12,960 years ago based upon this kind of research as being a date in which we likely had a cosmic encounter. Then, two years ago, the, the, the research of, 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 uh, of uh, Richard Firestone and West and all of their colleagues was published in which they found the signatures of a cosmic event and they dated it right at 12,900 years ago. Well, they came to it w without reference to the archaic traditions. I came to it by reference to the archaic traditions and it seemed to me that that's what everything was pointing at. And then of course there was the evidence itself in the field that, you know, we, me and Brad have documented and in, 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 in the last couple of trips we've seen evidence firsthand out in the field that there was a major remodeling of our planet at 12,900 years ago. Well, what I'm getting at is we now know that within the last, oh, 100 to 150,000 years, there have been at least a dozen global catastrophes, at least a dozen that we now know about. Yet we humans have endured through that whole process. How did we manage to survive when the woolly mammoths didn't, when Neanderthals didn't, when the saber-toothed cats didn't, when the giant ground sloths didn't, when 13 other hominid species didn't? How did we manage to survive? How is it that we are able to be sitting here tonight having this discussion? Well, if you read all of the myths, they're all consistent in one element. Somebody within the mass of humanity had foreknowledge. And they responded by, typically in the Judeo-Christian tradition, what did Noah do? He built an ark. Right? He built an ark. And then, of course, Zisithrus in the Sumerian tradition, what did he do when he had foreknowledge? Built an ark. What did Manu do? You know, in the Indus Valley tradition, what did Manu do when he, he built an ark? Now, we always picture arcs as being big wooden boats. And I think it's highly plausible that people did build big wooden boats to survive the kinds of floods that have now been geologically confirmed to have happened. But maybe they built other kinds of arcs. <laughs>